Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third in a series of uh, webinar, industry webinars here at Osage University Partners. My name is Bill Harrington, and I'm the managing partner here at OUP in charge of our life science investment activities. Today, we will be exploring some of the unique challenges facing diagnostic startups with our panelist, Garhang Kong, who's a founder and managing partner at HealthQuest Capital, a LabCorp director, and a very active diagnostics investor, and Doug Fisher, partner at InterWest Partners and chief business officer at Sarah Prognostics, a university spin-out in which OUP is an investor. Both Garhang and Doug have a lot of experience in diagnostics, and you can see their more detailed bios, hopefully, on your screen right now. We selected diagnostics as a topic today because while investments in biotech have reached record highs in an investor uh, in recent years, venture investment in the diagnostics sectors has really eroded and cooled considerably. This uh, is despite a rapid decline in the cost of sequencing, increased public interest in the uh, potential for precision medicine and industry's interest in companion diagnostics. Our goal today is to provide guidance regarding how to think about the diagnostics market overall. We'll cover some current areas of investment interest, because there are some, and provide suggestions on how to advance university-originated diagnostics technologies. The webinar today will be structured as a panel discussion with Q&A, with only a few slides containing data points relevant to our discussion. Thanks to those of you who sent us questions in advance. If you haven't submitted questions and would like to do so, you can queue up questions for us anytime during today's presentation using the Q&A feature on your toolbar. Sometimes we will rephrase or combine questions, so you may hear the substance of your questions addressed with slightly different wording. Um, I'm now gonna turn our speak to our speakers for brief introductions, and after that, we'll focus specifically on university spinouts and diagnostics, and then broaden the discussion uh, to discuss diagnostics market overall. Uh, Garhang and Doug, I'd like you to, each of you to take a minute or so to introduce yourselves. Uh, Garhang, and maybe you could also uh, cover your focus at HealthQuest. Uh, so Garhang, we'll start with you. Uh, sure, hi. Um, good morning, this is Garhang Kong. Uh, I'm a uh, physician scientist, uh, engineer of business by training, and uh, Former Glaxo Welcome, um, McKinsey, and uh, a couple of uh, healthcare startups, uh, but have been investing in healthcare for the last 18 years. Uh, we founded HealthQuest about four years ago with a focus on uh, medical technologies outside of traditional biopharma. Uh, so we do invest uh, meaningfully into uh, diagnostics uh, devices, platforms, uh, and healthcare IT as well. Um, we're based in the San Francisco uh, Bay Area, but do have offices on the East Coast as well, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Thanks, Garhang. And Doug, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your background and maybe one or two sentences on Sarah's story and how sure. universal technology fits there? Sure. Um, so my brief background, um, uh, I have an MD and an MBA from Penn Med and Wharton, but I never did a residency. Instead, I worked for Senecor. Well, they were part of J&J &J for a little while. Then I jumped to the Boston Consulting Group, where I basically worked for Pfizer and a couple other big pharma companies for two and a half years. And then I jumped into venture, and I've been doing venture for 11 years, and I, I invest in drugs, devices, and diagnostics. Um, and first, I was with Newly Venture Partners, and, and I've been at InterWest for eight years now. And um, my, one, of, one of my most exciting investments is, is what Bill mentioned, a company called Sarah Prognostics. Um, that was started as a spin-out from the uh, University of Utah and BYU where they generated some interesting, what I'd call discovery data on diagnosing women who were likely to have preterm birth. Um, and it was actually crucial to get that IP out of, out of U of U and BYU. And actually Osage was very helpful in, in setting that up uh, because that's what attracted the venture money to it because it showed you could develop a blood-based diagnostic to diagnose women who would have preterm birth that and that got everything going, raised, you know, raised $20 million and we validated a test and then launched it and brought in LabCorp to help, to help us commercialize. But it would never have gotten started without, without, that, without that IP in the beginning. Is there anything else you, you want me to say, Phil? Uh, no, that's good. Thanks, Doug. Um, so before we get started, uh, my colleague Stephanie Stamen, who's uh, one of the senior associates here at OUP, will get us started 
presenting a few slides on some recent developments and data in the diagnostic sector to set the stage for the rest of the discussion. Stephanie? Great, thank you, Bill. Uh, to kick off the conversation, I want to highlight some financing trends in the diagnostic sector. Uh, first, a little bit of good news. There were 51 Series A financings in the diagnostic sector last year, which raised $478 million in total capital. This is just shy of double the number seen in 2015 and the highest level seen over the past four years. If you look at diagnostic deals across all rounds of financing in the bottom graph, you can see the median deal size has remained relatively steady and is down only slightly from the high seen in 2015. To put this in perspective though, if you look at the therapeutic sector by comparison, the median deal size for a therapeutics company has more than doubled over that same time frame. It grew from 15.3 million in 2013 to 36 million in 2016. So there are clearly unique challenges that diagnostic companies face when raising capital, which is something our panelists will be discussing in greater detail. Uh, so as an investor, there are many key areas of diligence that we consider, but at the end of the day, there has to be a clear path to an exit. And this is one area in which diagnostic companies have fallen short. Uh, M&A deals in the sector have steadily declined over the past three years, and there were no diagnostic IPOs in 2016. Uh, this lack of IPOs is likely caused, uh, at least in part, by the poor market performance seen across the sector in diagnostic companies that have gone public in previous years. And although the sample size is small, uh, for the companies that have been acquired, you can see in the graph on the right-hand side uh, that both the median upfront and median total deal sizes were up in 2016. If we again compare this to the therapeutic sector though, in 2016 the median upfront for a therapeutics deal was 200 million and the total deal size was 535 million. So you see far more bio bucks and potential upside with therapeutics exits than you do in diagnostics. Uh, another negative is really the lengthy time to exit. So in 2016, the median time to exit was 7.7 .7 years for a diagnostics company, but only six years for therapeutics. So as a typical 10-year venture capital fund, a difference of almost two years to an exit is really pretty meaningful. And then finally, the last topic I wanna to touch on is a relatively new phenomenon in the diagnostic space and that's the significant increase in investment activity from groups not typically active in diagnostics. Uh, as investment from life science VCs has decreased, more traditionally tech-focused VCs, such as Data Collective and COSLA, have stepped in to fill some of that gap. There's also been an increase from corporate VCs, angel groups, and investors outside the US. I think it's too early to call this a trend, and the jury is still out as to whether the tech VCs are seeing something that the life science VCs are missing, but I'll leave that to our panelists to discuss further. And with that, Bill, I'll turn things back over to you. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, for those who might be interested, those slides will be available to you after the, the webinar. Um, <clears throat> so, Garhang, I think I'll start with you, and, and both D Doug and Garhang, I'd like you to weigh in on this, but you know, one fundamental question that we get from our our tech transfer colleagues is what what is it that makes a diagnostic startup attractive to venture investors and why what features should they look for or try to focus in on how could they present technology in a more compelling fashion uh, and, and and quite frankly the flip side is what uh, potential diagnostics companies are just not likely to be successful and not worth pursuing uh, Garhan could you start with that sort of overall what makes a diagnostic spin out attractive and why yeah, no, happy to uh, to talk about that. I think that, you know, given the fact that <clears throat> a lot of um, university uh, tech transfer offices may also be familiar with uh, biotech, pharma, therapeutic spin out, <clears throat> I'll do some uh, contrasting there as well. But, you know, at the end of the day, one of the things that uh, we are trying to recognize, of course, is value in a diagnostic. Uh, and the types of diagnostics that get valued are those that actually dictate clinical uh, therapy. So it's the, it's the last factoid, if you will, that
that tells a clinician or a patient to turn left or turn right. Um, and what I mean by that is, sometimes my wife is a cardiologist, and you know, you can order a lipid panel, you can get blood, so you can do a lot of things that are diagnostic in nature, uh, but not a single uh, data that forces you to take this drug. Uh, Hey, Garhang, we're having some technical difficulty hearing you. You're breaking up. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you now. Okay. Uh, so what I was saying is that it's important to find the uh, diagnostic data points, if you will, that drive therapy. Uh, and so, you know, we actually want the incremental data uh, point, if you will, that would change what a physician or a patient will do. Frequently, a lot of the diagnostic tests out there, uh, you know, have an interesting biomarker. Uh, they may provide additional information, but it's additional information in the context of 100 other data points that need to be all factored together. And so in that situation, you know, those uh, diagnostic tests are much less valuable. And so uh, w one of the first things we ask is, you know, does the outcome of this test change therapy? Uh, and then the second question behind that is, what are the health economics attached to that decision? So does running this test uh, change therapy, presumably for the better? And what are the economic impacts of having this information in terms of does it cost the system more money or less money uh, once that decision has been made? Uh, and so a lot of times what we have found is diagnostic tests get invented or developed because it was an interesting finding scientifically, uh, but it doesn't drive clinical therapy or it doesn't advantage the healthcare system from a health economic uh, point of view. Uh, so I would say those are two initial uh, large filters. The other part that I would highlight with respect to contrasting it to call it drug development or therapeutic companies is where does the value get created? Uh, and, you know, in a drug company, sometimes you have early hit to lead or you can have uh, clinical candidates or you can file an IND and then, of course, phase one, phase two, phase three data. And value is actually created all along the development chain, if you will. Uh, and you can have quite valuable uh, drug companies that have no revenue. Uh, but on the diagnostic side, it's actually quite different. Most of the value uh, does not uh, get captured during product development. Most of it is on the commercial side when you start selling things, uh, when you start getting reimbursements, uh, and so forth. And so all of a sudden, the goalpost, if you will, for value creation for a diagnostic is a little bit different, and if you will, farther down the path than a drug. Uh, and so, you know, as an investor, we need to keep that in mind uh, because that helps dictate where we're willing to start engaging with a diagnostic product. Uh, so a few thoughts uh, to consider, which, which might be a little bit different than, um, than other uh, you know, more typical therapeutic companies. Thanks, Garhang. Uh, Doug, do you have anything uh, to add or, or contrast uh, to, to some of the, the issues uh, Garhang brought up? Sure, no, I'd be happy to. So, so one, I, I agree. Oh, very much with what Garhang just said, and it's particularly around the point of when value is recognized in, in diagnostics. So, uh, so when we've invested, we've always looked for exactly what Garhang said, you know, diagnostics that change management and have an impact on cost of care and, you know, and improve outcomes, of course. Um, but what we found is you don't really get rewarded until you get reimbursement in place. And that takes a long, long time. Um, particularly if you need to get reimbursement approval from CMS or if you need to get reimbursement approval from contract insurers or both. Um, that is a two to three year process after you've launched your test. And all that takes a lot of money to be a commercial company and to be fighting reimbursement battles. And fighting those battles often takes outcome studies which can be rather expensive to run and, and, and can be almost as expensive as pharmaceutical trials. I think that's one of the big um, issues that a lot of diagnostic companies have been having and a lot of investors have been having with them, 
which is, I mean, I, I have one company in our portfolio that had a product on the market, but no one's really interested in talking to them, not only until they had CMS reimbursement approval, but until they had a price set. Because CMS first makes a coverage decision and then sets the price later. And that company has been going for at least eight years. And it took them that long to get there. Um, and th those are the things that, that make it difficult. And that's why when I think of the profile of a company that will get funded moving into the future, I think they are, they are ones that find a way to revenue prior to having to do that. And, and, and we can get into more uh, specifics around that as, as we move forward. Unless you want me to talk about it now, Bill. Well, I think that the question, I'd like to bring it back to the TTO and from the perspective of a licensing agent, you know, weighing the pros and cons and path forward for a diagnostics idea, um, you know, how developed does a diagnostic venture have to be before approaching institutional investors and, and maybe building on what you said, how can you address this, you know, distant goalpost of, of reimbursement and pricing uh, which is hard to even visualize when you're looking at, you know, the university disclosure or IP or discovery. Is there any way to kind of shorten that distance or to get to revenue or give a potential investor comfort that there is a path to revenue? Um, uh, so you want me to take it first and then? Yeah, why don't you continue right? on that, your thoughts? Yeah, so I think that the way to do that is that as you're thinking, of, as you're seeing interesting ideas coming out of academia, uh, I think the key is to make sure that there are multiple markets for it. And by that, I mean, you really want a research market available that can either be, that can either be other academic researchers um, or can be pharma or even research labs, but that can, that can buy these things that are not regulated in any real way um, and don't require tons of clinical data you know, to, to get physicians to adopt it if it's on the physician side. You just want something that researchers need and pharmaceutical companies really want that can generate a revenue line fairly quickly. Because if you can show an investor that, you know, they're, they're, that there are customers for this product right out of the gate, I think that's something that, that really helps. Um, the other thing to do is to be in an area where there are clear, clear predicates. So I think Sarah is a, is a good example of that. There were a bunch of NIPT companies, all of which could raise money and NIPT, for those not familiar, is non-invasive um, prenatal testing. That's um, drawing uh, blood from a pregnant mother at between weeks 10 and 14 and, di and being able to, to diagnose, well, to screen them for um, tri any type of trisomy. And those companies all raised money, and, and most of them did, did fairly well with investors making money. Uh, and, and if you have a, a company that, that, that is in a similar market that with, with, those, with clear predicates like that, um, that's a place where you can sometimes attract venture capital, but then the, the other place really is where they can get to revenue quickly and then they also have clinical applications down the road, which will take more time and more money, but if the company already has revenue or you can, you can see very quickly to revenue, I think that, that, is, that that's the type of opportunity if I were in your shoes I would be looking for. Thanks, Doug. Garhang, talking, they're turning to you for just a minute. Uh, you know, one of the th things that, that I guess one mistake we make sometimes is diagnostics are considered in one giant bucket, but, but as you're obviously aware, they, they really run the gamut. And, and one avenue of, of investigation and discovery that we've seen at universities it revolves more around materials and methods where they're, you know, coming up with faster, better, cheaper ways to do routine testing not so much, you know, new biology testing or, you know, uh, sequence related testing. And, you know, Theranos is maybe an infamous example of that. But to the extent that those technology enabled testing platforms uh, are, are coming out, whether it's point of care or not, how, how do you think about those or how should university technology transfer professionals think about those more technology focused opportunities yeah no I think that's a really important category if you will within diagnostics because you know for a long time most of uh, the diagnostic industry was built around either tissue samples or you know blood samples uh, but in fact uh, and then you know sending it back to the central lab uh, but this concept of 
point of care, you know, very small volume uh, testing uh, or, you know, testing that doesn't require blood at all, uh, either through saliva or other means, uh, you know, is, is quite important. And usually, uh, if the technology is broad enough that you can, in fact, run many different kinds of measurements, off of a uh, new sampling technology, uh, then in fact it can be, you know, quite valuable. And what we have seen is that companies will tend to, you know, pursue something, uh, a clinical use case, uh, pretty early on. Uh, you know, I think the days where you get to license your technology uh, to a hundred different diagnostic uh, test uh, companies, so that they can use your new point of care or new sampling system and you get a royalty from it is is harder uh, to both finance but also to get credit for, if you will. Uh, so most of the companies, even if they have this platform technology that could be widely applicable, uh, they will pick one or two use cases that, you know, sort of highlight the fact that, you know, uh, their, their sample prep is very minimal or uh, you need very small volumes, uh, but some use case where the technology is particularly good and actually roll that all the way out. Um, and then, you know, people can start to draw a line across uh, different uh, other uh, diagnostic tests. Um, you know, Theranos, even though it's infamous, uh, you know, it really uh, caused people to pay attention to point of care diagnostics. Uh, you know, I won't speak for LabCorp, but LabCorp or Quest or pick any other large diagnostic lab that has a lot of infrastructure in a lot of central labs, you know, everybody said, hey, look, we've got to step up our game with respect to point of care because, you know, whether it be Theranos or one of the 100 other companies that are trying to do it, at some point, uh, we're going to get point of care diagnostics. Uh, you know, the problem that we've been running into today, of course, is that the technologies are not broad enough sometimes and you know they're really good to test for one lab value uh and so that's great if you need to test for you know a specific um uh, biological molecule or you know sodium or whatever it may be you can get it off of pinprick that's that's great uh but the problem is you know the, the physician's office or, or walgreens is not going to have a hundred of these point of care machines each of which can only measure one thing uh, and so we're still looking for the broad point of care platform that uh, that can measure, you know, multiple analytes, if you will. Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, as the TTO thinks about it, um, you know, I do think there's actually quite a bit of upside if the technology is broad enough. And I would encourage, you know, their companies to to consider proving it out deep in one or two areas, uh, as opposed to you know, making broad general statements and, and then licensing it. Great, thanks, thanks uh, very much. And and would those systems, do you think, ultimately have to all integrate with um, you know lab information systems and 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 broader um, EHR uh, kinds of systems, or do you can you envision little standalones in physician offices? What about the systems uh, element of that? Yeah, no, that's actually a, a really important point. Uh, ultimately, they all need to uh, interface with uh, lab information systems. I mean, even in the, the large centralized labs, like LabCorp, where they've got thousands of these machines, whether they be sequencers or uh, fax machines or whatever it is, they're all from different manufacturers. They're all sending out data, <laughs> and they all have to send their data to, uh, you know, a information system that uh, – you know, when the physician gets the lab report, it, you know, they don't care if your, you know, CBC was run off one machine and your Chem 7 was run off a different machine. It all shows up on the, you know, the lab uh, output sheet. So that will absolutely be true, you know, in the physician's office if they have a point of care um, device or if it's, you know, at Walgreens or CVS or uh, pick wherever you want. And so that sort of uh, connectivity, I think, will be important. In fact, we have seen at least a few companies who, uh, whose, you know, essence is, is a software company to manage lab data. 
uh, and you know, that's a pretty specific market, but it serves me uh, an important one. Got it. And then, and, and then, uh, Doug, could you, and, and Sarah, I think, kind of falls into this category, but could you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, diagnostics that are, require sophisticated equipment uh, for testing, whether it's, you know, NMR machines or something that would be in a centralized facility where the samples are obtained in the field and all sent to one place? And, and as a follow-on to that, you know, is that something that is infinitely scalable? Or at one point, do you start thinking about um, regional centers or moving to CLIA-waved kinds of testing methodologies? Uh, so, so from from the investment perspective, I, I actually like the CLIA model mostly because um, it you know it gets you out of going through the FDA. <laughs> Um, and and for a venture back company, you're not you're not going to have the the resources to you know have multiple centers, right? Um, and and for and for a small company doing it out of a single lab works. You just have to have a test that is providing valuable enough information that people are willing to send you the samples uh, because it is an inefficient process from the standpoint of you, you can't just draw blood and run a ton of tests on it. You have to draw a separate tube to send to, to send to the lab. But you can certainly do things with those technologies that, you know, LabCorp isn't doing today. Hence why LabCorp did the, did the deal with Sarah. To do the work that Sarah does, they, they're doing massively parallel mass spec. It's a, the type of mass spec called multiple reaction monitoring. Some of you may or may not be familiar with it. Um, and it's a very powerful research tool because off of one, um, off of one basically 150 microliter amount of blood, you can look at, Three, five hundred proteins, you know, at, at one time, and it really doesn't cost you more to look for more protein. Um, and so they're they're very powerful in in what they can do and the research that they allow you to do. And so it works for a, a very you know a small venture backed company. Uh, and and the CLIA model is really the only way to do that when you're talking about a, a clinical diagnostic. Um, and then as the company grows, I think it would absolutely make sense, you know, to start opening labs in other places. And there are other there are other um, clear lab companies that have done it, but you generally have to be a public company uh, to get the resources to open you know multiple facilities, and you have to be doing enough volume to justify it. And that, so I think it's much more of a financial resources slash how much volume are you doing um, argument, and it's something that a company will only really need to really deal with when they're pretty successful. So, so with the CLIA model, though, I mean, the Achilles heel there is the transport and integrity during transport of the sample, because typically you're measuring proteins or sequencing or, you know, you're measuring things that are sensitive to how the sample was handled. So right. how does a startup do that and, you know, in, in a reliable way and convince investors that, uh, they can actually do that commercially. So, so at the end of the, so yeah, that's a, that's a great question. It's something Sarah's had to focus on and actually was part of the reason they, we did the deal with, with LabCorp. Um, so what Sarah does and what you need to do for these mass spec machines at the moment is you, you draw blood, you spin, spin it down, pull off the serum, then you freeze it on dry ice and send it. And that is actually the most expensive part of the whole cost of goods for the test. Um, and we're not the only company that does that. Uh, and it, it, does, it does create a barrier. It's worth doing if you provide information that is valuable enough, you know, that you can charge a high enough price that that cost of goods is, is justifiable. So it's really about finding that application where you're really providing what, what Garhang said before is, you know, th this, is really infor this is information that truly changes the path for, a pa for the decision the doctor makes and the path for a patient um, and, and and saves the system a lot of money, right? What the way Sarah is dealing with it, and and actually this, another great example is uh, Ariosa. You know they were doing an IPT testing, and I think they were doing that initially where they were freezing samples and shipping, and they figured out a way to not freeze. They developed their own tube, um, and and started getting shipments on basis basically being able to ship at ambient temperatures. Um, and I'd say that's a big thing that Sarah's doing too. 
one of the reasons we had to do the LabCorp deal at Sara was we don't have the draw centers across the country to do what I just said, draw, you know, drop the serum and then freeze. Um, so we needed that deal to move the company forward. But the, the thing we are, the next thing we're trying to do is get off of that and get on to a, a much easier way to get to, to ship samples, which is probably going to be filter paper, which we've been experimenting with. And I know a lot of other companies are, and that's something that actually as a, as a tech transfer office, it's something to look at when you're looking at technologies of what do they do and what samples do they need to do it on. But if it's a more complicated, if it's a more complicated method, then you definitely need a test that adds a lot of value. So, so Garhang, is you know when you look at LabCorp Quest, you know the large consolidators um, for any startup, a diagnostic startup, do they ultimately have to have a strategy? of gaining access to the economies of scale uh, that, that one of the large consolidators have. I mean, Doug just mentioned draw centers across the country. Um, you know, do you need to have a path to get to LabCorp request and a compelling value proposition, or can you really go forward with a, a go it alone strategy as a diagnostics company? You know, uh, I think it depends on what kind of diagnostic test you have. You know, we have three uh, CLIA lab diagnostic companies in our portfolio right now, none of which have a uh, deal with LabCorp request, uh, but they're pretty specialized tests in the sense that, uh, you know, one's in, uh, you know, pediatric developmental delay and others in uh, melanoma. Uh, and so these are not um, primary uh, screening kind of tests. These are specialist tests that, <clears throat> you know, you have a, pretty serious issue, uh, the specialist physician will order the test and send it directly to our company's labs. Uh, you know, there are several thousand dollars for these tests. Uh, and so there's no need in some sense to, you know, one of the advantages of a lab pool request is they have, you know, thousands of uh, lab blood draw centers around the country and, you know, patients can get there easily. But in these Specialist situations, uh, it's not really necessary. Uh, and so we have found that companies can, in fact, uh, be quite successful with without it. Now, what the large companies can do, even in these situations, of course, is they have a lot of um, sort of marketing power, if you will. Uh, and, you know, doctors may be more comfortable, you know, sending something, since they send all these other tests to LabCorp, uh, to send this other cancer diagnostic test as opposed to one-off sending this test to some lab that maybe they've really never heard of. So, it, uh, you know, there are some benefits to it, but, you know, it's certainly more than possible to have uh, companies uh, succeed uh, without needing that infrastructure. And then there's a couple ways to do it, right? Either your test is, a, uh, is one that doesn't require it, or, you know, to Doug's point, uh, you can convert your test such that, um, you know, you don't need to have that infrastructure if you can, you know, send in, you know, blood blood spots on filter paper to uh, to the Sarah Labs and you can sort of bypass all that infrastructure as well. You know, turning, well, I have one more category question. Um, you know, one of the things that we see frequently are, I'll call them companion diagnostics. I mean, HER2 and Herceptin are probably the best known, but you know, as more cancer therapeutics are being developed targeting specific mutations, the diagnostics to identify those mutations have taken on increasing importance. And, you know, one of the questions, of course, is, is there really a viable commercial strategy to be the standalone companion diagnostic or not? And for a number of our institutions, they have identified novel biology or novel ways of um, monitoring or measuring the presence or absence of a mutation, and the question is whether that can make a compelling company or not. Can either of you guys comment on companion diagnostics uh, and whether or not that may or may not be compelling? Uh, you, um, you want me to take this first, Garhan? Uh, sure, go ahead. Uh, well, I'll start. Mm -hmm. I think it, it really depends on the indication that you're looking at um, and the battle that you need to fight in that indication. So if, here's an example. Um, 
let's say you have a, a test that can identify whether you're going to respond, whether a patient will respond to immunotherapy or not, because responder rates are usually in the 20 to 30 percent range for immunotherapy. Um, my bet is the pharma company is not going to like that because you're going to clip their market by two thirds if your test is good, right? And you're going to have to fight a battle there against the company. Now, the spending on those things is so high that you'll probably get big fans on the insurance side. And, you know, if physicians are acting, are, are acting rationally and morally, they will, they will like it too. Um, we can all talk about how often that happens, given the money that flows in healthcare. Um, but, you know, that, that, that's a place where you, you have to think about it. Um, there are other examples of, like, a gene mutation that, that you need to diagnose um, for, for a therapeutic. There, I think you have an interesting business model because the, assuming the pharma doesn't want to do it and you're the only company that can, then you have a much more interesting model. So I think it really depends on the specifics of, of, the, of, the, indica of, the, uh, of the diagnostic. Uh, but it, in those types of companies, I definitely want to have more than one product because I don't think one product is generally going to make, make a company in that space. But Farhang, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think, um, I think there's a couple things. The, the macro trend is absolutely true, which is there will be more companion diagnostic, diagnostic. And, you know, we want our therapeutics to be more focused in, you know, the people who take them. We want it to work for those people. So that makes sense from a patient outcome point of view. It makes sense from a health economic point of view so that drugs aren't wasted on those who are not going to respond. Uh, but we have not seen that companion diagnostics have been able to capture the value, if you will, for identifying those patients uh, en masse. And it may be that uh, there haven't been as many drugs that are huge, uh, and huge not just in terms of sales, but huge in terms of number of people who need the diagnostic test uh, <coughs> to, um, to make it a company. So I think Doug's point about multiple products is uh, almost certainly correct. Uh, and, and you know, even then, it has to be you know some significant diagnostic uh, tests. So I uh, com companion diagnostic tests. So I suspect that they will be more and more developed, uh, but it will be hard to to make a standalone company, uh, certainly on a single companion diagnostic. Uh, I also think that you know most people have heard this statistic, but you know diagnostics might be one or two percent of the healthcare spend. Uh, but it dictates something like 60 or 70 percent of the uh, rest of the medical spend. And, you know, you get the results of a diagnostic test, and then you go to surgery or you get chemotherapy. Uh, but so far, you know, they haven't been able to capture more than one or two percent of the value. Uh, and so I don't know if it's just the mentality or the culture of the healthcare system, but most of the value gets ascribed to the therapeutic, uh, even though the companion diagnostic is in theory, the one who identifies which patient should get the drug. Uh, so, you know, that's been a tricky uh, phenomenon. We had a long debate with pharma because <clears throat> they went to the venture industry and said, hey, we need more diagnostics to tell us which patients are going to respond to our drugs. And we said, great, we would love to uh, develop them. In fact, I remember probably going to five of the top ten pharma uh, at their request to talk about this. Uh, but then when you ask them how much value would you be willing to give to the test, would you give us a, you know, two or three percent royalty for finding each patient? Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, things got very, very quiet. So, um, you know, I think that's been tricky. I've, I've had the same experience, which is generally why I, we haven't invested, at least at Interwest, in many, in many companions. Okay, um, thanks guys. Uh, one other area that we see uh, opportunities, you know, really often coming out of integrated delivery networks or hospital systems associated with our university partners are kind of home brewed, la uh, you know, LDTs that um, groups are trying to productize. And, you know, there's been talk for years now about the FDA regulating L LDTs and what that might look like. You know, as you think about, you know, LDTs going forward, does that change how you look at them or do you handicap the risk that they'll be regulated somehow under the a broad umbrella of 510K? Uh, and does that make them more or less attractive? Uh, 
You want to start a car hang or you want me to? Uh, I'm happy to share some thoughts. You know, Go ahead. Uh, the, uh, the discussion about, you know, the FDA regulating LDPs has been going on for, you know, 10 years probably, maybe even more. And then, uh, you know, people, you know, the FDA brings forth a set of guidelines and then the industry fights back and, you know, LabCorp uh, got, you know, it's set of councils, I'm sure every, you know, large lab and small lab uh, that cares, uh, you know, opines on that. Um, and it, you know, to regulate, there's just so many LDTs out there that uh, regulating it, I think, would be, you know, quite difficult. So now they're talking about, of course, certain kinds of tests that they would regulate <clears throat> that are more, you know, acute or more serious. And, and so that's probably the more likely first step, you know, if and when that happens. Uh, you know, when we look at uh, opportunities, we certainly factor that in, but that's, that's sort of this, you know, ongoing, uh, you know, possible concern. I think it's very hard to predict is that going to happen a year from now or two years from now or eight years from now. And, you know, uh, our time horizon has got to be within the, that window. So, uh, I would say it's a macro concern, but it doesn't usually, you know, it's not usually the determining factor. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Uh, and and I, I, I don't really think they're going to do much on it for a while. They, they've talked about regulating NIPT that way for a long, long time, and they haven't gotten around to doing it yet. And that's also been going on for at least five to seven years. Um, we, we take a different viewpoint, both at Sarah and, and, and at InterWest, um, where we just we want our companies if they want to take an LDT and turn it into you know a real diagnostic um, to do a clinical program like it was getting regulated by the FDA because that's what physicians want to see they want to see that kind of data just like the FDA wants to see it so we want to run those studies that that could be submitted to the FDA later for approval um, and and we find that there's probably, we think there's a lot of overlap between what the physicians need to see to want to prescribe the test as well as what the FDA would need to see if they decided to regulate, even though I, I, I see that regulation coming much further off. And as Garhang said, there's so many LDTs out there. If the FDA really tried to regulate them all, they'd have to like triple or quadruple the size of the FDA, which isn't happening anytime soon. Um, and they're even having trouble even regulating a few of them. Um, so I don't, I don't see them fixing that for a while. Okay. Um, you know, getting a little more granular, uh, you know, one of the, the other aspects of startups, uh, diagnostic startups that our, our tech transfer colleagues struggle with is leadership management specifically. You know, often it's a PI that has the idea, uh, you know, they generally are going to keep their day job you know, trying to assemble a team to take an early idea forward. Are there characteristics that you want to see in kind of these emerging management teams? Um, you know, obviously a CEO who's been there and done that is great, but, but uncommon. So is there anything you look for in terms of the team composition or when you want to put a team in place, how you like to do that? Um, Doug, I'll probably ask you to go with that one. Yeah, how to how to think about that. So I, I, I can tell you from the, I mean, the only way you're going to raise money is if you have, you know, a, at least a couple dedicated players. I mean, if you're thinking about it from the perspective of what's going to get funded. Um, and you usually need not just the scientists um, who developed it. You're going to need some, some person that's been around the block on the business side uh, to take it forward. And the sooner you get that, the more likely you have a chance of raising money. Um, and without that, it, it, as a tech transfer person, it wouldn't be something that I would prioritize. Is that, a, is that a, a good way to answer it? Yeah, I guess the question is, what does that business person have to look like? Uh, oh. You know, likely you're going to have a, an experienced diagnostic executive, possible. Any any thoughts on like who they the the tech transfer folks should think about or how they should approach oh, sure. them? That's what... Yeah, I think it'd be somebody that's had some experience developing because these are so early developing 
um, a diagnostic product would be the best, or at least has had has been in pharmaceutical development, but has worked with diagnostics as well. Um, on the development side, you know, it doesn't have to be the CEO or the CSO, but but someone who's been involved with a product, uh -huh. and uh, and you know, been at least I don't know a director or a VP, something like that. Garhang, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, when, when I don't know, pitfall is the right word, but one of the things that we have come to realize is that even though diagnostics feels like it's close to therapeutics and is related, um, it's a totally different business. And so, um, you know, having some former executive from Pfizer or Glaxo or Novartis um, show up and try and run a diagnostic company, I think, is in fact uh, quite difficult. Uh, so I do think it is important uh, to have somebody come from the lab space, uh, the diagnostic space, because uh, it's, uh, it's actually not anywhere near running a farmer company. Yeah, I mean, I just I agree with that. Yeah, you know, finding finding those people is is often harder than even finding the money because, but obviously they go go hand in hand. So thank, that's a very good perspective, Garin, because often we do see, you know, pharma people recycled into diagnostics companies, and, and it really is a different beast. Um, you know, we have had a lot of a number of questions, kind of getting back to the fact that many of the university innovations are around technology that lends itself to a platform diagnostic of, of some sort and you know that has multiple clinical applications addressing multiple different markets you know for that type of opportunity you know is is the value creation taking one single market application and going deep with it or validating that in fact it is a platform that has potential across multiple products addressing multiple markets. We talk, touched on this earlier, but we've had a series of questions kind of trying to get some clarification on that. Um, Garhang, do you want to take that one? I think you yeah, talked sure. about this earlier. Uh, yeah, so look, I mean, I think that uh, when there is multiple applications, multiple therapeutic areas, the temptation, of course, is to, to do all of them. Uh, but you, you know, <clears throat> if you move 10 footballs down to the 10 yard line, you still get zero points. Uh, you actually have to get one or two of them into, you know, across the goal line. And so I think the key is that even if you have 10 different applications you could pursue right away, um, you need to show, you know, soup to nuts that your technology works for at least one or two tests um, before, you know, advancing, you know, six different programs in parallel. Now, in that situation, though, I do think that there's even more additional value in considering a partner. Uh, not, I don't think the business model should be we're only going to do licensing deals because that, again, is, is hard to capture a lot of the value. But if you are both developing one or two products on your own off your platform and then doing um, some deals for other tests uh, with your platform, especially tests that you couldn't otherwise access because you know, the partnering company has some specific IP around it, but they're benefiting from your, um, you know, sampling technology or your sensing technology or, or whatever it is. Uh, then uh, I think that actually comes together nicely as a model where you have one or two that are your own and then maybe two, three, four that are partnered and otherwise proprietary. You know, frequently the <coughs> one or two that are your own are not proprietary, it's just that they're proprietary by virtue of your tech platform. The you, you know, individual marker or analyte is probably well established. In fact, that's probably the right way to go about it because you know, you don't want to take sort of risk on risk, which in theory is both on on the marker and on your technology. So it seems like those kinds of models uh, gain a little bit more uh, traction. Great, thanks. Uh, one, one area, I guess, related um, to something we talked about earlier and Stephanie touched on, you know, we have seen, you know, traditional tech investors like Kosla or Data Collective 
writing some really large checks in some diagnostics companies, uh, you know, particularly in the liquid biopsy space. Um, you know, really astounding sums of money. Uh, you know, what, what's going on here? I mean, what, what are you guys seeing as you talk to your colleagues? Uh, you know, we don't see the, tra rarely see the traditional life science investors in those deals, you know, with the eight, nine hundred million dollar kinds of valuations. Yeah, I can, I mean, I can start the, off if you'd like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, are the um, tech guys seeing something that we're all missing or, or are we just looking at the world through different lenses? So, so I'll, I'll answer in a couple of ways. Um, I, I, this tends to be a cycle that, that I have seen over the past, oh God, 15, 15 years, maybe 20 now, where you know, life science investors who've been burned before, you know, um, don't you, you know, do certain things certain ways. And then the tech guys, things are going well in tech and they start looking for areas of expansion and they say, okay, we're going to take the tech rules to healthcare. And they don't generally understand how you know, the, the markets of, in healthcare are quite different than what they are on the tech side where there are basically no rules, whereas we have many, many, many rules, both written and not written. Um, I, I am skeptical of a lot of it personally um, because it seems like they, they see a big data problem. And, and I, think, I know Data Collective is some, is, and, and they're very smart people, but, you know, they think they understand big data as, as someone who's invested in companies that are basically dealing in big data in other ways, you know, when you do a mass spec and you're looking for, you're looking at 500 proteins to look for signals, you learn how hard it is to, to differentiate the signal from the noise. And I don't think they realize how hard that's going to be, particularly in liquid biopsy, where the trials that you have to run are so big and the variables are so huge, which means the patients that you have to get are substantial. And I don't even know if $900 million is enough. But um, I, I think what you're seeing is they're, you know, they're, they're getting, you know, tech has been flying and they're looking for areas to expand and they want to take some, some of the concepts they see in tech to healthcare. And I'm not, and they're not focusing like they probably should, like Jarhan talked about before. You know, they're, they're just going to go and, and use some big data tools to see if they can find the signal and the noise which I think will be much harder to find than they realize. Um, that's my own personal opinion. I mean, the markets are huge, which is what's driving them. Um, but it, 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 it's, I think it's a lot harder than, I don't know, than, I'm not sure if they realize, but that's my own personal opinion. I know, Garhan, what do you think? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, it's uh, encouraging that there's more capital coming in. I will say that most knowledgeable diagnostic investors uh, you know, have not <clears throat> shared the same abandon, I guess. Uh, you know, people talk about Theranos, uh, and that was really just more fraudulent than anything else. But, uh, you know, there were no traditional healthcare investors in that deal. Uh, probably because if there were, you know, people would have figured out that there's nothing there. But, um, uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, I guess, to be fair, I have two thoughts. One is, you know, 90 or 95 percent of my brain agrees exactly with what I was saying, which is it's really hard to do. Uh, you know, these tech investors have enthusiasm to, uh, you know, sort of crack the, the next tough problem, uh, except our problem has, you know, a couple major differences. One, there's this thing called Mother Nature. Uh, and two, there's this thing called regulated industry. Uh, and so, you know, uh, that in my mind, usually predicts some difficulties. Uh, but I actually also think that it takes some naivete to, to do things that are unprecedented. And so, you know, part of me is actually, uh, you know, encouraged that, that there's people willing to put $900 million together to pursue, you know, uh, liquid biopsy and, and so forth uh, and go after a very, very difficult uh, problem. And, uh, you know, if they succeed, great. Uh, if they don't, there's going to be some value in there. And the truth is, we'll probably invest in some, you know, aspects of what's left over. So, um, you know, we're uh, we're just sort of we're watching it, if you will, uh, and then we'll see if it uh, if it turns out. But I think that the uh, verdict is still uh, quite a ways out. 
By the way, it would be great if it worked. Yeah, but, uh, no, I think we all that, would agree that. That far out. <laughs> so I, I think we're pretty much out of time or close to it. And I, I want to be sure we don't just get shut off by the uh, the technology. Uh, Doug Garring, any closing remarks you'd like to make uh, for our, our tech transfer colleagues here who are still going to struggle with, you know, what to do with a diagnostics opportunity? Yeah, I mean, I've got a couple things. Um, I do think that uh, the diagnostic area has traditionally been quite difficult, in part because companies have not been uh, successful. And I don't mean scientifically successful, I actually mean commercially successful, uh, because they haven't really understood um, the reimbursement piece of the pie. Uh, and so I would encourage, uh, you know, as, as your offices are considering technologies, to think really hard about how the uh, reimbursement and the payers are going to react uh, to whatever data is being generated from this test and, and whether or not it will be received favorably. I don't want you know to to leave this talk with with uh, you know doom and gloom by any stretch. Uh, you know we continue to invest in diagnostic companies. Yeah, you know I mentioned we have three that we've invested in over the last couple of years. Uh, you know and continue to be active in that space. Uh, we do think that if you have a test that provides information that's other not, otherwise not attainable and, and dictates clinical care uh, with, you know, a health economic advantage, that it should get paid for. Uh, and in fact, the margins there can be quite good. Uh, you know, we have companies that, uh, you know, have tests that are thousands of dollars uh, that cost just a few hundred dollars to run, and they're not being priced on, you know, cost plus. Uh, they're being priced on what value do they drive, right? So these tests can, can drive $100,000 decisions. Uh, you know, do, does the patient get chemotherapy or not? Uh, and so in that case, it's, you know, easily worth a few thousand dollars to, to find out which patient will benefit and which won't, uh, for example. So uh, even though, I mean, everything's hard is the truth, but, uh, but we, we still believe that diagnostics will, in fact, be a increasingly important uh, factor in healthcare, and you know it's not going to go from one or two percent of the healthcare spend to seventy percent, but we do think it will continue to grow as people force, not people, the system forces us to be more specific about how we direct our therapies. Got it, Doug. Any any closing comments, uh, sure. words of wisdom or encouragement? So, so what I, I will echo what Garhang said. I don't, I don't mean to be given gloom either. I'm actually very excited about diagnostics too. Because if you're, you know, the focus is on reducing the cost of the system. The only way you do that is by, you know, is by allocating treatments better by identifying the patients who really need them. The only way you can do that is by getting better diagnostics. And I would just encourage everybody to, as, as I said at the beginning, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring it around to the end, um, you know, look for those opportunities where you can get early revenue. And you take that reimbursement issue off the table because you can find uses for these things that are outside of clinical diagnostics, and then you can do the clinical stuff later. And that's the model I'm, I'm excited about. Great. Okay, well, I think with that, we're going to close our session today. I want to thank Gar Hang Kong and Doug Fisher for taking the time to join us. I think it's been a great conversation. Uh, for those of you on the line, we will have some written notes from this available and the slides available shortly. Uh, so I think I'd like to say goodbye from Osage, and we look forward to uh, hosting you at the next uh, OUP webinar. Thank bye -bye. you, Bill. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Bye.